Bennett asks if his video is showing up. No one's video should be on. So, all right. So we're live on YouTube now also. So. Bennett asks if his video is showing up. I have a huge audio delay. No one. That's on the that's on the YouTube channel. All right. So here we are. All right. So this is, let me record. All right, so this is episode two of New Histories. Um, so we're going to, so the idea behind New Histories is that we are going to be discussing kind of new media photography and the, the impact of kind of digital technology on the visual arts. Um, so we're going to have a series. This is like a, a trial kind of pilot series to see if, you know, what kind of interest we can get into the, discussions on this topic and um this is a uh, works with the yield magazine uh project at the uh, rackland murphy museum of art which just opened last weekend um wow. so i'm gonna jump what's that so i'm gonna jump right into it so uh the host of uh new histories is gregory eddie jones uh, he is a post-photographic artist and writer exploring the intersections of photography and new technology. From 2012 to 2020, Jones was editor of In the In-Between, an independent online journal that examines photographic practices rooted in techno technological exploration. He has since worked as chief writer and editor for several art and photography organizations in the NFT space, including Fellowship, Photoverso, Botto, and Galdi AI. I can't even pronounce that right. Mm -hmm. Jones has contributed numerous essays and interviews to publications that include Foam, After Image, Paper Journal, Lens Culture, and Unseen Magazine, among others. As an artist, his most recent body of work, uh, 4923, combined AI generated images with scans of vintage photography magazine pages to form a conceptual bridge between the past and future of the medium's technical evolution and i know you've been doing some very other very recent things gregory if you wanted to share that also and uh i'll turn it over to you uh sure thank you yeah um maybe what you have in mind is the show of um the exhibition of promised land which is a, a body of work from uh 2021 that i just exhibited in uh in a new festival in, uh, in in Rennes, France, called Glaz, the Glaz Festival. Um, but yeah, uh, Mike, thank you for that introduction. And I'm very, very happy to introduce our uh, second guest for this series, Oliver Weso, who I've been uh, a, a, a big fan of for a long time. Um, Oliver Weso, uh, born in 1960, is a fine art photographer. His work has been included in numerous national and international group shows, including such benchmark exhibitions as Manipulated Photography Before Photoshop at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Image World at the Whitney Museum of Art in New York, and his work is included in the permanent collections of many prominent museum collections, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Whitney Museum, and MoMA, in, also in New York City. Uh, Wayso has produced two books, Artist Unknown in 2007 and Friends, Enemies, and Strangers in 2018. He's been the recipient of various grants and awards, including a Lewis Comfort Tiffany grant in 1999, and in 2000, his second New York State Council on the Arts grant. Welcome, Oliver. I'm so glad to have you. Thank you. Nice to be here. Um, let me just ask, uh, somebody mentioned they were having trouble hearing me. Can people hear me now fine? I, I can hear you well. Okay. Um, and the other thing I want to say is, um, Mike and Greg, when you guys were talking, you were breaking up a lot. And I don't know if that, is that on your end also? I mean, I don't really care if I'm coming through. You're coming uh, through. Um, I'm not hearing any uh, breaks or anything, um, but okay. I think you are fine. The recording seems to be going well. So I think um, 
I would just plow through it if you start to hear breaks and it, it the recording should catch everything. All right. I mean, yeah, I, like I only heard half of what you just said, but if people can hear me, I guess that's that's all that matters, right? Okay. Yes. So the other thing is, I'm I'm going to be showing a um, PowerPoint. So um, I am going to go to my uh, let's see. Sorry, one moment. This, of course, is what we all should have done earlier. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll shift to select. I don't want to select two desktops. Are you guys at any PowerPoint at the moment? Yep. I can see you it. are. Yes. Okay. So you see black and white in a color photograph. Mm -hmm. So I will just try to burn through this pretty quickly because um, I, I'm really more interested in sort of dialogue and conversation, hearing what people have to say. So, um, you know, I've, I'm old and I've been doing this for a long time. So I have a lot of work and I, 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 I I'm not going to show a lot of it. I'm going to really try to um, put the focus on um, AI, which is something that you know, in so far as these conversations you're having are about sort of imagining the speculative futures of photography, certainly AI um, fits in that in a big way. And so what I'm choosing to do really is to look at, go back and look at my work, not necessarily, not in any way, uh, in, in a way, but in, 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 in a way I've been thinking about it a lot lately, which is that I, in many ways I feel like I've been for AI all my life. Um, and so I, I, and I've been thinking about anticipated or my interests, anticipated some of the things that AI has to offer. I'm gonna, that, that's gonna kind of be the umbrella, the frame in which I'm gonna look at stuff. So I, I just wanna quickly go back. Um, you know, I, I'm called a, photographer and I've sort of been called a photographer and I don't know what photography means anymore in many ways photography is um is dead and has been you know reborn in a glorious glorious thousand glorious ways um you know so when I say it's dead I don't mean that in a negative way I just mean it's it's certainly radically changed in the late 70s early 80s when I was making work there was this sort of um you know, if you looked at the history of photography, there were these two things that are sort of manifest in these two pictures, in uh, Bresson on the left and Steichen on the right. And pardon me while I talk fast, I just want to kind of zip through all this stuff. So this image on the left, the black and white picture was kind of the modernist trajectory and history of photography, which was, you know, defined by the criteria, the aesthetic criteria was how it was framed, capturing the decisive moment, this kind of, you know, this this thing that you went out into the, or that you managed to capture that a painting couldn't do. But of course, the early days of um, photography, the pictorialist photography that wanted to sort of establish itself as an art by mimicking or adopting sort of the language of painting, uh, as you can see in this picture by Steichen, um, sort of eventually gave way to that other type of photography. But when I looked, you know, when I first started playing with photography, I was much more interested in the kind of pictorialist, the manipulated image, the, um, you know, the potent to a picture uh, after it's taken. And I think in many ways, you know, in, in the early 80s, as a lot of artists were sort of challenging, you know, the, the veracity of the photograph and engaged with the fictional qualities of the photograph. It was a kind of a, a re-examination of pictorialism is, I think, that anticipated, you know, the digital uh, Photoshop and the digital uh, sort of revolution that followed shortly thereafter, where the photograph became sort of a more malleable thing. And it's funny, I was um, you looking at the Steichen picture again with these, the Flatiron Building. Yes, y'all are seeing that. Did I go forward? Just want to check. I can't tell yes. you how many. Yeah, can't how many PowerPoints I've done where like 15 minutes in, people are like, excuse me, are you talking about, you know, a PowerPoint that they don't see? 
Um, a few years ago, I noticed on Instagram, there was an ad for some filters. This is probably 10 years ago, actually. They were selling filters to uh, some program that would, you know, mess with your picture. And it was, and, and I thought it was interesting that they chose to use the Flatiron building. It seemed to me like a sort of uh, probably conscious and maybe, maybe unconscious nod to that pictorialist streak. Anyway, um, in the early 80s, I started working with uh, photographs that I made by a lot of homemade special effects. And I call them photographs because they were photographic prints. They were cebachromes, but they were heavily sort of manipulated, mediated, uh, you know, I, I pictures more, more than I was taking them in some ways. And they were often uh, long sort of film uh, images. And, you know, this is long before Photoshop and um, there was a certain, you know, people would look at the pictures, they would want to know what they were, where, where all of these questions that we don't really ask of photographs now. Um, and I was also, um, you know, and I was very interested in this kind of, the kind of painterly qualities of the photograph. Um, you know, I was making these pictures through, through, by taking some pictures with my camera, but also mostly by rephotographing um, a, sort of small fragments of pre-existing images, usually advertising. And I was interested in the kind of, um, I don't, can you see my cursor on the screen or no? You know, this kind of stuff that happens back here. If you look right there, you can see it down here. At that point, before Photoshop, there were computers, Cytex, Corporation um, was making computers that allowed advertisers and people to manipulate pictures. And I was very interested in, in that. So I was shooting these small details, like these bushes down here kind of show up here. So I was sort of seaming all these things together, this whatever it is, Neutrozone, little science icon, you know, turned into this. Um, and there was certainly a lot of appropriation going on at that time in, in the early 80s. And, 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 and to some degree, I was interested in sort of deconstructing the codes of advertising, but mostly I was just interested in the aesthetic and the look and the material of that. And, and, and you know, when sort of thinking about the learning sets, the data learning sets that AI is trained on, I sort of think about this kind of mass of images that they learn on as a kind of, um, a, you know, recognizing that every picture contains a million pictures. Um, and, you know, when I look back on that, I think, well, in some ways, you know, this this anticipates that. Um, so these are some other pictures I made. These were sort of in the mid 80s. They were kind of about um, abstraction, representation, fact fiction, uh, et cetera. A lot of kind of UFO imagery. And, and this stuff, they were usually presented in these Grids, I, I, I printed them large also, but very often they were pre pre presented sort of as gangs uh, of images. Um, and they weren't always abstract. They involved, um, you know, superimposition of found images, but always, you know, they were a process of post-production of something done with, by working with a huge bank of images to seam them together. Uh, and then in the early 90s, Photoshop came along. And um, and again, I'm just showing a few pictures from each of these series. But with Photoshop, obviously, the whole thing became much easier. You know, I could start seaming things together, uh, even though at that point, the Internet wasn't quite, you know, a, a place for gathering. It wasn't an archive that, like it is now. You know, I could certainly have a huge archive of my own material, some pictures that I took, some pictures that I found uh, and were seen together. But, uh, you know, Photoshop was a great tool for me, but it also sort of undercut some of the critical issues that I'd been playing with that had to do with the believability of the photograph, because people stopped believing photographs or start photographs. So a lot of the kind of tension of like, well, is that real? Is that that started to leave the work, and maybe I had to cop in some ways to the fact that I was interested in the kind of sublime Baroque uh, landscapes, you know, whether in, in 
as much as those critical issues, if not more. Uh, so indeed, the work got very baroque, and I sort of started to uh, tap into that, you know, 14-year-old inside me that loved, you know, Roger Dean and psychedelic album covers and, and all of that stuff, which, um, again, AI seems to gravitate towards that stuff too. But I was also thinking a lot about how like a picture like this, which I also made, you know, using Photoshop is a much more sort of, um, in some ways, a more mysterious and uncanny image because there is a degree of believability to it. So I feel like I'm always tacking back and forth between the, the sort of the veracity of the photograph and the subjectivity and sort of um, transcendent nature of, of painting. Um, so none of the, so again, many, many pictures, uh, I'm not showing you, this is sort of 20 years worth of, uh, of work, but um, the one thing that didn't exist in any of this work were, were people. But I had a sort of side practice of collecting pictures. It started by collecting pictures on the internet, but then went into collecting vernacular um, photography that uh, I found uh, uh, I was buying myself, thrift stores, eBay, where, wherever I was buying it. So these are, you know, just uh, literally thousands and thousands of pictures I have. And the kind of pictures that I collect, collect pictures that usually involve, um, they're always all, all portrait photographs, uh, usually with painted backdrops or hand painted so there's a real, you know, for me, the, the kind of fictional qualities of the images that I collect, um, use of painting and photography. Uh, uh, you know, so I, I saw a real correlation between this and, and my other interests. Um, and at some point uh, in the uh, early, at some point in 10 years ago or so, 15 years ago, uh, I started shooting my own portraits. So I'd never pho photographed people before. And I um, shot people, you know, told, I noticed my kids, when they would go to school, sat back with pictures, but they weren't posed in front of backdrops, but they were shot in front of a green screen. And the backdrop that you would put into it. Uh, this is a picture of my wife and one of my goats and on one side and my, my brother on the other side. Um, um, uh, it was it was a lot of fun for me to to photograph people, uh, and and um, allowed me to continue my interests in painting and photography, but um, to maybe put something I, I don't know it's another that's another story for another talk. Um, a couple other pictures from that series. So. A few years ago, um, I started poking around with these uh, AI portraits, which some of you might have seen before. Um, you know, people without birthdays, I think uh, I've, they've been referred to. Um, and you can literally generate, you know, countless numbers of people um, who don't actually exist. And I became really interested, you know, my, my interest certainly in the basic sort of postmodern issues of believability of the photograph and everything were, were, were very related to this, um, but also just the ability to sort of make people just, just amazing. So I started combining people I made with people from my collection of pictures. So, in, and I would sort of make these strange families. Basically I could take features from people from my pictures and then create people that might be related to them. And I've always had a real interest in the um, kind of Sears photo studio look. So I, I could allow me to indulge in that also. Uh, and so I was, so these are just a few from that series. Um, and then of course, more recently getting into, you know, uh, Midjourney and Dali and all of these AI generating programs came into being. And I started feeding my pictures into them. So this picture on the left is one from my collection. 
And these two portraits on the right are one of many, many that were, were generated by it, um, with, of course, a lot of text input and you know, editing and, and so forth. And I show these not because I necessarily like them, but because they, they really interest me. And in some ways, what I was struck by was that I don't like the pictures I'm generating as much as I like the original pictures. You know, there's something, the fact that they are still tied to the reference, to the thing itself is what gives them their power. Like a picture like this, um, which is a real picture. It's just kind of what the hell, like where does that come from? So while the picture, the one on the right that I generated from it might be interesting outside the context of that, um, it's not as interesting as the picture itself. And you know, this is a picture on the left, the black and white one that I bought, which I really loved. And I really do love the picture that I generated from it. And again, this is one of many, many pictures and it's been edit edited after I generated it and so forth. But basically it's still, there's an uncanniness to the original um, that appeals to me more. Um, so more recently, I've been working with um, going back to apes again. And I was really interested to see, um, you know, I, I just want to go back for a second, by the way, just here. One of the things also that I, that I wanted to mention about my collecting of, of, of these pictures um, is that one of the things that I've always really been interested in is sort of mining the archive and, and just hunting for pictures and creating typologies and curating, if you will. I know that's an overused word, but I think it's one that is um, incredibly important uh, uh, in visual culture right now. And collecting these pictures kind of you know, not only sort of allowed me to tap into my interest in the staged and constructed photograph, um, but the, there's a kind of democratization, a democracy to these kind of pictures. And, you know, they're, they're, I think they're really great art, um, but they weren't necessarily made to be art. And so, you know, the recontextualization of them, of course, you know, goes a long way towards making them into art. But um, also just, you know, arranging them in different sequences. And uh, there's something obviously very democratic about photography in general, but I think, um, you know, in particular, this this kind of work strikes me as being very generous in some ways. And, I, and, and you know, I, I'll talk about AI more, and I know there are a lot of problems with AI. Uh, I love about it is... Um, is it sort of democratic? No. Some of the things I really, um, you know, that, that appealed to me about photography originally. You know, there, there were kids in school who could draw really well. And, you know, amazing. It's like, you know, it's an amazing thing. Um, I wasn't one of those. Uh, and I know that a lot of those people, when they get to sort of their MFA programs or whatever, you know, suddenly shocked to find out that that, Oops, I'm frozen. Am I frozen for you guys? Yeah, you're frozen, but your audio is still coming through, so I think it's fine. Yeah. I'm going to stop your video for a second and restart it and see what happens. Yeah. All right, we're back. Um. Anyway, so so yeah, that the promise of a lot of uh, of AI, I think, to um, present new forms of new processes that might be more democratic, which of course is one of the things problems people have with it. Also, but uh, we'll get to that. So I'm just going to quickly go through some pictures. I, I've been working on a series recently of landscapes again. I was really interested, intrigued in the idea, and these are made use, using 
AI and Photoshop and the new Photoshop, which has AI. Um, and talk a little bit about sort of process, because I think one of the misconceptions about AI that a lot of people have is that you just enter text into a program and get an image. Um, and yes, you can do that, but um, it's not necessarily uh, that that easy, um, or it's not, I mean, it's fine if it's that easy. It's not, it, there is more to that, and, uh, you know, and that appeals to me. Anyway, so I've been working on a series of images that sort of imagine which is something I've always been interested in, um, but a few, you know, might be one that is uh, where environmental disaster is imminent or um, where, you know, nature has come back. And I think that this is a, has fought back and this is a common theme in visual culture now, in popular culture, in worlds. And I think it's interesting that it's one that AI uh, lends itself well to the sort of imagined futures. Um, and these two are often shown in these sort of in gangs like this, though not always. Um, this one, I, these are two different pictures. And one of the things about AI, and I don't know how much you guys have played with it, but one of the things that interests me about AI is that people talk about it a lot in terms of photography, almost exclusively in terms of photography. And it does pose real issues, you know, when, when talking about journalism and, and, and talking about, you know, there are definitely problems when you start to lose the believability and the veracity of a photograph. But why the, you know, the, the developers of AI seem intent on creating a program that can replicate reality and I got to say, I was on Instagram today and I saw an AI influencer, a video of an AI influencer. The first time I've ever, I've actually was fooled. Like I really didn't believe that this person doing this stupid dance was AI, but she was. I mean, we are there. It's kind of amazing, but I'm really not that interested in that. You know, I mean, to me that that's where all the focus is and it is sort of, there's a lot of ethical issues around it. But to me, I'm much more interested in, you know, people talk about hallucinations, which is, you know, the word they use for glitches in, 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 in these programs is a negative. And to me, that's the positive, is it's like working with the accidents, the unpredictability of it. So I actually use old versions of old. So here's two sort of somewhat similar prompts of a kind of, you know, some sort of a breached uh, water situation, you know, drought and flood and stuff. They were, they were somewhat similar. And the one on the right is a newer, uh, I don't know if it's your right, but the picture of the um, the darker picture is using one, a newer version of Midjourney. And I tend to use an older version of Midjourney 3, uh, which is on the, on the left there. Um, here again, you can see these are two pictures of uh, golf courses uh, with fires around them. The one on the right, and again, they, they've both been manipulated a lot after the fact, but the one on the right is is made with a more recent version, and I prefer the more kind of painterly version uh, uh, of the image on the left. So this is you know these are all from this new series. I'm not sure which will make the final cut. Uh, these are uh, lithium fields. It, it, it's interesting how you you know you can really get these programs to kind of give you certain textures and certain. Um, Sort of uh, there's a kind of synergy or collapsing of effect that a lot of pro that Photoshop has that a lot of sort of add-on uh, you know special effects programs have, and that uh, the AI generators have, where the past becomes a kind of 
an effect in a, in a kind of narrative medium. There's a kind of nostalgia to it that is something one can harness, which I find really interesting. In some ways, special effects and types of film stock have become tools for evoking content. They become content themselves, special effects. You see that a lot in movies, you know, if they'll use like a certain type of film to evoke a certain period of time. But I think that's become really like a a, a common tool now. It's almost like a, a sort of the aesthetic of special effects uh, is really something that if you spend time on AI, these programs in, in a public sort of way, looking at other people's prompts, it's really in sort of the language that's used to get certain effects because very often it involves sort of um, pre-existing film stocks or, you know, uh, lenses or, you know, hardware. Um, so all of the kind of photo geek nerds who would sit around and talk about lenses and stuff, are, you know, being supplanted by the student generation who sit around and talk about ways of describing these lenses to get them to give you certain special effects. I realize I'm not talking about the content much here, but uh, but I'm uh, hopefully it's somewhat evident. The whole series of abandoned malls, which I don't know if you guys have ever spent much time in shopping malls lately, but they're kind of amazing in a depressing sort of way. Um, and these are, again, lithium salt flats uh, in Peru, I think. I mean, obviously very manipulated. So I'm just, I'm going to end on, on this slide. And you guys don't have to um, read all of this, I, and I'm not going to read it. But one of the things that, you know, I want to sort of open it up and talk a little bit now. But one of the things that I'm struck by in my sort of, experience both teaching and reading and thinking about new technologies and visual culture is that there's just never a technology that isn't met with pushback and hostility. And that doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of validity and truth to the hostility, but usually, but, but, but I'm struck by how very often the most progressive people take Charles Baudelaire, for instance, sort of the, you know, the king of, of modernism hated photography, thought it was going to ruin art and turn everybody into slavish, you know, uh, uh, automatons and that it was like the worst thing to ever happen. And it did put painters out of work. Portrait photographers lost their work, you know, and it did radically change painting. Painting, you know, sort of did, was, was released from that job. <laughs> and and changed radically, um, but it wasn't a bad thing. You know, it was something that took a while to develop its own aesthetic criteria. It at first sort of you know with pictorialism and stage photography adopted the look of uh, uh, painting, but eventually it developed its own aesthetic criteria. Uh, this next quote by the composer John Philip Sousa. He lobbied Congress about the record player. He thought it was going to destroy the world and that humans would lose their vocal cords and would become apes again and yada yada. Um, because he mostly he was afraid he wasn't going to be able to sell sheet music anymore um, when the uh, record player came along and he wanted Congress to outlaw it. Um, and he in some ways was right. People did stop playing music like they used to. People did stop sitting around. They became passive listeners to music. Uh, I mean, they still, obviously, some people still played music, but it did change the way one consumed music. Um, uh, but I mean that it didn't also, you know, have a wonderful uh, 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 things came of it. And then finally, um, anyone who went, lived through the sort of 
transition from analog to digital to Photoshop had to sit through, you know, countless conversations and in my case, faculty meetings where people talked about how Photoshop was going to be the death of everything. That now everybody would just do things in the computer and nobody would learn how to see anymore and yada, yada. And, and again, a lot of all of that. But I think, you know, most people sort of accept that, you know, is uh, um, an ethically challenging, challenging, but incredibly powerful thing that's here to stay and 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 people are using it so uh so i think ai too it will sort of uh have us is having a similar kind of pushback a lot of legitimate uh, uh criticisms of it to be honest the only criticism and i'm other than the journalism one the only one that i really worry about that i've been reading up about a lot lately is the energy consumption of these things. And it is not lost on me, the irony that I'm making this work that kind of addresses eco-disaster in some ways while using a technology that um, sucks a lot of energy. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, that is something we can deal with. Um, I'm less interested, or very interested, but I am less concerned about the issues that I think concern most people, which have to do with you know, issues of authorship and copyright. And then of course, there are people who are very concerned. It's not real art, that anyone can do it. So it's not real art, which I, I don't put much weight in, but I, but I enjoy talking about it. Anyway, so I'm gonna um, quit my PowerPoint. Well, that was really wonderful. Thank you, Oliver. Um, both both of those bodies of of work you shared are, are are super interesting to me. Both the landscapes and the portraits. When you were showing the portraits, um, you know, I, I I was thinking about the 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 source images you had. These anonymous um, portraits that you'd find at flea markets and things like that, and um. And 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 how like potent they are in, in like conjuring imagination, just wondering about the stories behind them. And it, it's interesting to me because um, I mean, not to speak too generally about how AI works, but these image generators are trained on photographs, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of, of images that they're trained to look at and decipher and, and to, to recreate essentially. Um, and, you know, it, it's exactly like those kinds of portraits that you collect that um, I, I feel like there are so many of those that are probably fed into the training models of these new engines. Um, and, and it got me thinking about how like, you know, a, a photographic AI image um, essentially built off the pixels of actual photographs. It, it contains so many echoes of the past that um, that are embedded in the DNA of the picture that we'll never really know about. Um, it's just a re really, really interesting thought that came to mind as you were showing it in, in, in talking about that particular work. Yeah, you know, that idea of the open-ended narrative of those found images, you know, once they get removed, where and fuck it, closing again. There we go. Once they get removed from the original owners and their their stories are are, are taken away, you know, that that really interests me. Um, yeah. And that's something the image doesn't have. You know, it it. I mean, one could argue, I suppose, that yes, there's the DNA of all of these pictures, but you know, and I think that the stories that DNA that AI generated portraits tell, where you're not feeding a picture in, but you're just feeding text in. To me, the story that they tell is often the story of our collective uh, demons in some ways. You know, people, because when you type in doctor, you get a white and you should get upset. But the problem isn't the AI, unless that's the learning model you're giving it is only, you know, if you specifically do that. But that, that too many pictures of white doctors out there. 
then we have a problem, a cultural, you know, we have a social problem of inequity uh, and racism. The, the 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 software itself, you know, might reinforce it, but I, I still would argue that it's 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 reading the DNA of our, you know, collective self. Yeah. And the fact that when you go on there, seventy five percent of the people typing in prompts are typing in, you know, babe in a bikini standing next to a spaceship, um, which is. You know, I, and people say, well, oh, so, uh, so much of this AI art is shit and everything. Well, so much of most, I mean, go to your local county fair and look at the art. And it's great. I love, you know, art in the county fair, but a lot of it is, you know, girls in bikinis standing next to sports cars. Yeah. Um, you know, the problem isn't the technology as much as the people. So yeah. I jump in real fast. I want to, so I had a question about, it, it uh, tracks along those lines. So the idea of like, what I run into when I'm, because I'm critical of, I don't, I don't use the technology that much. I've kind of dabbled in it just to see how it works. But you know, as a someone that likes, that is interested in kind of collecting and the idea of how you collect work and how you create your own aesthetic and things like that, I always am fascinated by the way people want to talk about it. So, like, you know, when I see the work, I think a lot of the times I think I look, see it and I think of like illustration, like I think of it in that way. And then and I, and then sometimes I see some of it and I think, oh, that's that's real art. That's fine art. Or that, you know, like you were saying towards the end, like these images, you know, kind of create a narrative. So they still have that illustrative part of it, but they, they're creating a narrative and they they're almost cinematic. So what I always run into is like me trying to explain or trying to uh, um, analyze the work and, and people get kind of a little offended by me using the word illustration and things like that. And my feeling always is what's wrong with it being an illustration? Like why not? It can be an illustration. It can be more illustrative. It can be more cinematic and things like that. Your uh, photograph of the billboards in that, that landscape to me that that leaned more towards like an artistic choice and it was had some um some idea of the sublime in it it was talking about things in a different way and so i just want to know what from your perspective and and how you've interacted with different people like how how have how have you kind of taken to the conversation mm -hmm. when it kind of doesn't always go like where you're hoping it goes or you know what i'm saying so well, look, I think, first of all, illustration is really just a way of saying something that exists between painting and photography, often, not always, but but it's definitely meant in a sort of, it suggests commercial art, uh, you know, it suggests a mechanical process, maybe, or, you know, something less profound. We, we have a lot of language and, and, and a lot of mythology built around art. And the thing that AI challenges most are those things we prize the most physical labor right that's the number one complaint you get from people all you're doing is entering text well first of all so what if that's all you're doing right yeah i thought we'd move beyond that conversation i mean you know just not put a toilet on a pedestal and you know, i mean it's like context and meaning it's just great making knowing how to paint it is great physical material is great god bless you if you use it i like i love it you know but we fetishize it and we and we sort of you know photography went through the same thing all you're doing is pressing a button frankly when i'm working with ai it's a much more laborious process than just taking a photograph right so so labor even though it shouldn't be a criteria that we use is certainly something we you know we really mythologize and, and value, and we should value it, but it, but but that doesn't mean that other things aren't good. Um, the second thing, of course, is originality, and originality is great too, but we also know that everything is built on parts of what came before it, right? And, you know, the greatest, some of the greatest music of the, you know, you know, of early hip hop was made by, you know, remixing found fragments of stuff to create this great music, right? Until, you know, the law made it's only rich people could afford to sample music and stuff. 
it's a whole other conversation, but this whole issue of sort of you're working off of the labor of other people, while I understand that it's not, you know, I don't mean to dismiss that because I do think there's a lot of punching down in this situation, whereas, you know, good remix culture punches up and uses, <laughs> you know, st stuff by uh, people who already have money. I, it's not like AI goes in there and makes pictures by using these images. It learns from the way we all learn, but, right? And yes, you can type in, you know, make me a something in the style of, and then put in an artist. But if that artist is, most of the time, if that artist is well known enough to be in the data learning set, they're making money already, first of all. And most of the images aren't made from those if you don't specifically, you know, tell it to. It's just made from a kind of what it learns from. This is assuming a large open data set, you know, that, that isn't more and more, I think, like Adobe's new Photoshop, which is really fun and fascinating and powerful, but it's made it copyright concerns. So they're making it only with Adobe's uh, stock library. So it's a much more limited data set and therefore not as, as good, frankly. Um, you know, so that's the other big objection you get is, is I think, the, the, is the issue of, um, you know, uh, originality, that it's not original. Um, and I think it's every bit as original as anything else because you are the one humans have to make it you know this is again it's really it's 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 as creative as you want it to be right i mean you can make shitty paintings too <laughs> and many people do it's not the medium it's the artist that, that determines how, how good it is um so yeah i think i think you know those are those the, the ai is mostly criticized because of what it doesn't do that pre-existing media and technologies did. And it's going to be quite a while, I think, before it develops its own um, aesthetic criteria. Uh, and again, I'm not saying any of this, to, there's, there's many ethical problems with AI. Um, but I think the focus is frankly on the wrong, the wrong issues and, and, um, you know, the inevitability of, of it uh, you know, there's problems with corporate ownership of it, but then to use it to make something that subverts corporate ownership, if you can. Uh, but that's my that's my take. I get it, though. People aren't interested in it. Some people like physical material. Um, anyway, sorry, I could ramble on. But yeah, no, I think it's completely fascinating. And I, like you said, there's a lot of you know bad art being made, and that's not just related to AI or you know, it's it's across the board. You know, it's like. But that, you know, I still go and look at it and appreciate it and get a lot out of it, even if it's in the end, something I'm like, eh, you know, I could do without that. But, you know, just the, the I think it's difficult for a lot of people because there are so many younger people that are new to the idea of criticism and having a dialogue that they sometimes get frustrated when when someone gives them, like if someone says, oh, this this is more illustrative than it is like fine art or something like that. And it just seems to get, seems to throw them off a bit. And, you know, I grew up going through the art crit in uh, art classes and things like that. So you get a pretty thick skin eventually. And I think a lot, a lot of younger people that may have not went through that process find it a little more difficult to hear someone say, yeah, you're not going in the right direction or this just, this looks like an illustration or something like that. So I, I, I I like the conversation. I mean, I I love to have discussions with people and and getting kind of these back and forth. So I, you know, as far as the 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 AI community and the the larger like NFT digital art community, there's a lot of people coming that have a very different backgrounds than I think the typical kind of school of art process. So that's that's what I was interested in, and uh, yeah, so. Gregory, I'm sorry I hijacked for a second, but go ahead and <laughs> no, uh, I, I mean really great thoughts. Uh, I, I just wanted to mention that um, we we plan to go until eight, which is about ten minutes from now. So if anyone listening wants to jump in with any questions, I, I want to make sure I offer the opportunity to do so. Um, yeah, just click the raise your hand, and then I'll uh, make you guys able to to talk. Somebody mentioned, by the way, that I hate film. I don't. I love film, by the way. 
I'm not even going to try to pronounce your name. <laughs> uh, but if you want to say your name and then whatever question you have. I uh, just want to say thanks for doing this. It's so great to hear Oliver again. He used to be my teacher at Leslie. And I love the man. And uh, I just uh, was glad, glad you did this. He's a, he's a, He's been an inspiration to me. And uh, and I'm even older than he is. I'm 71. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I've tried older to than me. Wow. I learned so much from Oliver. Thanks, Al. Yeah, bye. Um, Who else has a question or a comment yeah. about the? Well, while we wait, one other thing I wanted to touch on um, is, uh, I, I mean, just kind of generally, your, the, your landscape work really interests is really interested in me because I, I feel like there's such a fundamental tension between, you know, you, you depicting the natural world and these kind of environmental disasters, and then all wrapped in this frame of technology. I feel like there's a um, maybe some kind of fundamental question there about, um, I, I mean, the, the nature of this technology and the value of it in, in relationship to, you know, our, our traditional, um, you know, presence in the natural world and what's being sacrificed or what's being taken uh, for granted within all of these new contexts. Yeah, I mean, I've always been interested in um, sort of the sublime and romantic landscape and, and all of that. And it, I think at some point, you know, the the sublime moved away from nature and in, in, in towards technology. Um, and you know so there's a kind of the beauty and terror of like a nuclear bomb or you know an electrical failure or something like that becomes the kind of contemporary the volcano or the hurricane or the tornado that you know was to, to earlier generations and, and there's something weird's not the right word. I mean, just horrific about living uh, in that thing, which was a predicted dystopian future. I've got two kids and it's kind of like, you know, I read the predictions and it's just, it feels like, you know, we grew up, our generation grew up under the sort of cloud of the mushroom cloud um mm -hmm. but it was always like you know god i hope we don't, don't probably are going to but i really hope we don't do that but now we're kind of like you know we're the frog in the pot with the water boiling and we're doing it yeah. and yeah. i don't know how to respond to that you know like as a parent i don't know how to respond to it. as an artist i don't know how to respond to that in the ultimate sort of I don't know. The thing that's always struck me as being wild about everything from war to environmental disaster, whatever, it photographs really well. And I mean that in the most, you know, sort of not cynical, not callous way. I mean, there's something just awful about the fact that, you know, um, we can be witness to this stuff and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you know, decking it. So yeah, I think that that's to be able to kind of use this technology that's built on, you know, by mining the archive of all of our images to create kind of speculative <laughs> vision of of a thing that's a future, but not really much of a future. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, and and with AI, there's uh, you know there there's a, a feeling of like creepiness that I I still haven't been able to shake. It's like this feeling where like uh or, or this kind of subtext that almost says like humans have made like everything we can make already, so let's just let machines remake it all until the end of time. I I don't know. That's a really crude way of putting it, but there's I mean it's. It's a tale as old as Frankenstein and probably as old as 
humans, you know, making people in our own image. And, and I think, you know, it is created, but I'm not sure, like, it, it's weird that we're at that tipping point right now where you really, you know, so, you know, so far the creepiness has been in what it, it in the space between, you know, the uncanny valley stuff, right? But what happens when we move beyond that and like, you know, uh, uh, into actual where you can't tell the difference? Yeah. Will it still be creepy then? Yeah. And, and 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 to me, there's uh, this other question of you know, and, and this is probably for a whole other conversation, but you know, the these AI tools being developed in service to like this image economy or, or this desire to be able to produce things so much quicker and faster and cheaper, and it there there's a, a question that starts to seep in about like, do we really need this or do we really want it? um you know it feels like we're just kind of being taken along for a ride um in the larger kind of march of of capitalism and and for better or worse um you know we we adapt to it or we you know we, we risk having the fear of falling behind yeah no question i mean i've always sort of held to the idea that technologies themselves are kind of neutral and and there's always something good about them and always something bad about them it depends how you use them i did hear somebody today say God, what would happen if we just paused for a month yeah. and just shut all social media down for a month i'm just thinking like god that would really be nice <laughs> but i don't know you know i also the other day got lost for the first time because I didn't have my I was in my car without my cell phone I couldn't find where I was going <laughs> it was horrible <laughs> you know, one aspect to this AI and the new technology too that I think it's sometimes gets overlooked is the idea that it's a great sketch pad too like it doesn't have to be like a final product like just getting your ideas out and seeing what they look like and working through it i mean the iteration that you can get through so quickly i mean it's like it's like with photoshop you know you listen to these designers graphic designers that didn't have photoshop before and then they have photoshop and they say that they can iterate so much more quickly and get to that kind of higher level of of what they were hoping for before photoshop yeah i see the same thing with with ai and these generators also it's just a it's a great way a tool just to 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 visualize something and that doesn't yeah. mean you have to have the ai photograph has to be the end piece you can take that and recreate it and and do something i have so many things. students who are painters who use ai to generate images to work from and stuff you know and i just want to and i don't mean to be all pollyanna just as one final sort of uh positive thing you know i talked before people used to play recorded music you know used to play music and then they went in just listening to records and they became very passive i think that a lot of these technologies which kind of allow us to activate pre-existing images are kind of an old way of making art that's that are similar to storytelling or you know passing on shared stuff ever mutating constantly changing stuff that isn't fixed and locked into sort of a, a final thing you know i mean a painting obviously is locked by virtue of it being you know a done singular object but you know vinyl or a photograph or something like that they're they're kind of done right once you do them but but ai is never done you know it's always you can just keep per making permutations of it mutating it putting it on the internet having more mutations and permutations I, I think that's a healthy a healthy thing and you know the corporate ownership of this stuff is a huge problem but the corporate ownership of everything is a huge problem you know? <laughs> the problem is is to kill the billionaires not to kill the artists <laughs> yeah it's all what you'll be happier if you just kind of embrace it and as long as they are you know it's not a complete dystopia that we end up creating uh i think like embracing the the corporate you know ownership is 
for um unfortunately for us probably the only thing we can do at this point <laughs> yeah maybe well i'm sorry i sort of feel like this happens when i teach sometimes i kind of because i tend to cheerlead for this stuff i i never hear from i always feel like people who uh, voice their uh dislike or or fears or objections to this stuff so i i uh but don't scare people off from doing that because I do, I do think that a lot needs a lot of the ethical issues surrounding this stuff need, need definitely need to be addressed. Um, but uh, my my impulse tends to be because so much of the pushback tends to I think focus on the kind of simplicity piecing of creativity rather than looking at you know maybe the larger issues of the implications of this stuff in terms of and i think there's still a good i mean programmers and the people involved in it there's still a bunch that seem to have this kind of idea of o open source and free use and things like that i know that the corporations tend to want to when they see something that they can profit from they are ravenous about trying to take it over but then you know then that splinters off into something else also so i think we as creatives you know and technologists i guess like do a fairly good job at subverting what the corporations want from us so yeah, you know man. you get co-opted as soon as you you step through the door usually i mean it's it's a it's a it's a hard battle i don't mean to be overly cynical about it but it's, yeah I, I long since i i am never a utopianist about technology i mean i saw what happened Mm -hmm. I remember when we all sat around bitching about how there was these three white guys telling us the news every night and how horrible that was. They were telling us the same. Wouldn't it be great if we had a world where everyone had an opinion and everyone could weigh in with their version of the truth. And now we have that world. <laughs> it's right. So I'm, I'm reluctant to get too utopian about all this stuff. Well, the, it's fun though. I really enjoy it. Like I'm a very much a glass glass is half full kind of attitude about things. So it's uh, I think it you know boils down to your attitude and just you know your life experience you know in the moment. I guess so. I I, I have a lot of optimism. You know, it's it is kind of a scary thing. That, you know, they the way they talk about AI and talk about how you know the potential for all the damage. I mean, it's it, that's you know I. I don't know. I just never kind of get on that boat that I just want to keep going down that path. I, I always think, uh, well, you know, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. There's always a silver lining. So <laughs> curious thing is I, I heard an interview with somebody recently who, who AI chief AI developer and has been involved in this for years, this linguist. And he basically said that what we're getting right now is just the stuff that's safe for them to give us like they've got you know some some stuff right now that basically it cannot just you know not just pass the bar it can basically you know pass the bar plus yeah i mean it's just like the stuff of the, the the ability is really uh they're not letting it out yet because they don't know what will happen with it yeah well, the idea of authenticity has been completely destroyed in, in the last 20 years. So, I mean, maybe the, even that kind of impulse from, you know, what's what's on the horizon will make us appreciate the authentic at, in, in the future. I don't know. I'm just. Oh, most <laughs> of we my can tell what it is. My students are in the dark room now. My students love film. They love work, which is great. Yeah. There's a real like return to the physical. And because people want that i'm kind of feeling that too i feel that it's it's out there yeah sorry greg i interrupted you oh no you're you're okay um well well this has been marvelous thank you so much oliver um uh really really enjoyed the uh the discussion and and seeing the work that you've been making um, really excited to see what comes next. I'll, I'll, I'll be staying uh, posted. Um, and th thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, this has been great. Um, our next one of these is going to be uh, on January 10th with, with Bree Soders, who 
um, who, who made an, a really incredible photo book called uh, Another Online Pervert, which was published earlier this year, which combined photographs with uh, snippets of conversation that she had with an AI chat bot. Um, and, and then there's another project she made uh, just a, a few years earlier uh, where uh, I'm trying to find the right way to describe it. There, there's screen captures of of um, Google hiking views, uh, nature views that yeah. are are. are uh, I, I, I'm not going to do it justice, but but join us next month and 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 she can speak about it much more eloquently than I could. I'll definitely go to that. She's great, and she did a book with uh, Saint Lucy Books, who published my book also. Yes. Uh, 11 years i think something like that mm -hmm. 11 years is what it was called yeah cool um, yeah thanks Thank everyone you. uh i hope you have a good night have a good holiday and um hopefully we'll see you back here next month thanks